These are difficult things. They're important things. And we need your knowledge, your wisdom, and your understanding. Father, your word tells us that if we lack wisdom, you will give it to us. If we ask in faith, not wavering. So, Father, we ask for your help tonight with these things. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. So we're continuing uh, learning to recognize the difference that not from of knowledge that comes from God and knowledge that comes from Satan, because just as uh, the fear of God has two parts, the holy fear of God and the unholy fear of God, there's two kinds of knowledge, one from God, one that comes from Satan, two kinds of wisdom, one that comes from God, one that comes from Satan. So as we are learning to discern the difference between the holy and unholy fear of God, this is why I give you the homework because really the only way you can learn to grow, to discern the difference, to see the difference is by actually doing the homework. Then we take what discernment God gives to us by doing the homework and we apply that then to wisdom. You might remember, I think it was last semester, we talked about what wisdom do they have? The, the, God speaking about the false prophets, preachers, and teachers. What wisdom do they have? And now we're looking at knowledge. So, <clears throat> if we could think back to last week, we talked about how God created us in his image. He put us in a rich place. Uh, he gave us these commandments and that he gave to us, you probably can't read this, it's too small, all the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that we needed to be able to uh, fill the earth, to subdue the earth, to have dominion over it. And he created us in right relationship with God. And we remember that Y-I-R-A-H, Yira, is the Hebrew word that is translated in our English Bibles, the fear of the Lord. It's the word that is used to describe those, uh, um, used to describe Adam and Eve and the right kind of relationship that they had. Then we talked about, and if you don't have a, one of the, a copy of, of the drawing, if you'll email me, I'll email you the, It's actually in Jewish, it's called a menorah. It's the seven, it's the candlestick that holds seven candles. And each one of those candles then represents one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, like found in Isaiah 11, one through three. And this, is the yinna that describes the right relationship that we were created to have. And then we talked about Messiah. And how Messiah was marked by the fact that the spirit of the Lord was upon him. And we read from Luke chapter four, how after Jesus had been baptized and God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He went into the desert to be tempted for 40 days. He came out, he went back to his hometown 
he read from the book of Isaiah, and he said, today in your hearing, the scripture has been fulfilled. This is a prophecy concerning Messiah. How would you recognize Messiah? That's why we say marked by his, uh, the fact that the spirit of the Lord was upon him, separated him from all the other people named Jesus, all the other people born in Bethlehem, all the people that lived in Nazareth. Um, it was ad identifying characteristic. So today, just as Messiah was identified by, fulfilled the prophecy of, of the spirit of the Lord being on him, the spirit on the Lord being on those who've been born into the kingdom is what identifies or marks us as true children of God. Now then, let's go back to Genesis chapter one. We're going to start in verse 26 again. God said, let us make man in our own image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So then Genesis chapter two, verse seven, another very important verse that we need to understand how it fits in here. This gives us some more detail about how God created mankind. Then the Lord God, you might remember that in Genesis 1, God refers to himself just by the name Elohim. Here, starting in verse 2, he calls himself Jehovah Elohim, or Yahweh Elohim. <clears throat> then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. This word that says God breathed into man. In both Hebrew and Greek, the word breathe and the word that's used to describe the Holy Spirit are very close to each other. In the New Testament, we have the scripture that says all scripture is given by inspiration of God is how it's translated in the King James Version. If we were to read it in Greek, really the better translation would be, all scripture is God breathed. That's how it says in Russian, right? It's a more accurate translation. All scripture is God breathed and God breathed into only mankind the breath of life, and we became, the Bible says, a living being or a living soul. So God breathed into us. We were created in right relationship. God as our creator was teaching us, Adam and Eve, but mankind teaching us everything we needed to know. And in fact, as Adam and Eve were created, as mankind was created, everything they knew was holy. They had no knowledge of unholy, only the knowledge of the holy. But Included in this was everything necessary to rule over, subdue, have dominion over God's creation. Everything that we needed to know. 
God made it. He knows how it works. He was revealing to man how it works so that, it, that mankind had everything they needed to know. And there was nothing that was necessary that, that God left out. God gave to Adam and Eve wisdom. Now, in their encounter with the serpent, they did not show good wisdom. They allowed themselves to be tempted, but that's for another lesson. But God gave us wisdom so that we would use knowledge for the right way. And last week we talked about when, using the example of sex, that when we use it the right way, the way God intended, it's, it, it's used to build up, to edify all of society and all of God's kingdom. And that is a characteristic of the knowledge that comes from God. It always builds up. It always edifies not just the individual, but all of society, all of God's kingdom. Now, on the other side of this, this is knowledge that comes from God. We need to realize that there is knowledge. There is an earthly, natural, demonic knowledge also. This is the knowledge that Satan promised to Adam and Eve in chapter 3 of Genesis. God said in verse 5, I'm sorry, Satan says in verse 5, talking about this fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now remember, knowing in, in the Old Testament and in the New speaks about relationship. They had known only holy up until this time, but Satan offered them knowledge that comes from having a relationship with good and evil. And we've talked about many times about that we were not created to have that kind of knowledge. And we, the example that I use is Adam and Eve knew by experience what it was like to have the child, the son they loved, that they raised, they tenderly cared for, to have that son kill their other son, murder their other son. It's a knowledge we were never created to have. Okay, so this earthly, natural, demonic knowledge, number one, produces spiritual blindness. When Adam and Eve sinned, they became spiritually blind. When Messiah came, being marked by, identified by, the Spirit of the Lord being upon him, he ministered in that spirit to restore sight to the blind. Number two, earthly, natural, demonic knowledge always produces broken hearts. Adam and Eve's heart was broken, not just by when their son murdered their son, but when they lost their relationship with God, when they lost their ability to live in that rich place called Eden. Jesus comes ministering, marked by, identified by Isaiah 11, one through three, and he binds up the broken hearted. The third thing earthly, natural, demonic knowledge does is it produces death. When Adam and Eve decided to take that fruit and to accept that knowledge from Satan, 
it produced death in them, physical death and also spiritual death. And number four, the fourth thing it does, it makes us ignorant of the truth. Look in Isaiah chapter one. Isaiah chapter one, verse three. Now, when God compares us to animals, he doesn't pick the smartest animals to compare us to. Verse three, God says an ox knows its owner and a donkey its master's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Now in English, we would say somebody's as dumb as an ox or as stupid as a donkey. Now, apparently in Hebrew, they have that same understanding. And God says, even the dumb ox knows who its owner is and the stubborn donkey knows where to go where his master's manger is where to go to get his food but israel does not know and they do not understand ignorant to the truth they don't know <clears throat> they don't know where to go to get knowledge and understanding first corinthians Chapter one talks about this in the New Testament. And this actually is point number five. That traditions do not make us right with God. Our culture does not make us right with God. Now in America, particularly to us in the South, we have a cultural Christianity. It's, but it, it has an appearance of reality, but it is not the same thing as having a relationship with God. Now, let's start in chapter one of 1 Corinthians, starting in verse 18. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Those who are in the world, who have the world's wisdom, who have that satanic, the wisdom that comes from Satan, earthly, natural, demonic wisdom, God said, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. The world's wisdom blinds us. The world's knowledge blinds us. We've talked about that tonight. It makes us spiritually blind. It breaks, our, breaks hearts, produces dread, produces ignorance of the truth. And here God plainly says, that the world's wisdom does not bring people to God. The world through its wisdom did not come to know God. Verse 22, indeed Jews asked for a sign and Greeks searched for wisdom. 
For we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Just as Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Truth is a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. The power of God is in Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in Christ, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. And he is also called the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despise God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. And again, we see this idea of repeating himself. Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that just as it is written, let him boast, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now, <clears throat> when we speak about the traditions of men, we can speak about the knowledge of men, it's really the knowledge that comes from Satan, but we can knowledge of men. We can speak about wisdom of men. It's not from God, it's from men. We need to remember that in for the Greeks, Plato and Socrates, these guys that said that the search for, the study of truth, wisdom, that these are the highest callings in, in man's life, but their knowledge and wisdom is knowledge and wisdom apart from God. But some of these traditions of men do have some benefit. For example, washing your hands before you eat. Uh, I once read a very interesting medical textbook written by a professor of surgery in the early 1900s. And he said, there is no scientific reason for a surgeon to wash his hands before he does surgery. But it doesn't hurt. And it doesn't take long to wash your hands. So since it doesn't take long, go ahead and wash your hands before you do surgery. It doesn't hurt. Maybe it helps. There is some benefit. But the benefit, but <clears throat> they cannot produce eternal life. Traditions, man's knowledge, man's wisdom can benefit to some degree, but they cannot produce life. But before we get away from this, remember that the knowledge and wisdom from God not only benefit and are unchanging, but they produce life. Now, one of the main 
objections to Christianity in, the, in our modern day society is people say, I have too much knowledge. I'm too educated. I know and understand science. And because of my knowledge, because of my education, because of my scientific abilities, I'm, I am too smart to believe in God. Remember the knowledge that comes from Satan, this earthly, natural, demonic knowledge, produces spiritual blindness, produces death, and that is a good example. And the last characteristics that we're gonna look at tonight of earthly, natural, demonic knowledge is earthly, natural, demonic knowledge steals from God's people their treasure. Of course, the treasure is the year of fear of the Lord. Okay. Now, we have to go back and just remember and touch on Messiah being marked by or identified by the Spirit of the Lord being upon him, these seven characteristics. And Messiah was of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. Messiah did delight in the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord was Messiah's treasure. Now we are to be like Christ. If Isaiah, I'm sorry, if Messiah was marked by, identified by his fear of the Lord, then we should also. If he was delighting in it, we should also. If it was his treasure, it should be our treasure. Philippians 2, starting in verse 5, the New Testament talks about these things. Okay, Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5. In New American Standard, it, it reads, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. In King James, it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This is another one of those words that's difficult to translate from Greek into English because the word has such a broad meaning and the meaning is important. God chose that word for a reason. And the word means to be exercising your mind, not to be lazy in your mind, but to exercise in the mind, exercise your mind. If, if, if I wasn't such a nice person, I might stop and say, this is why you need to do your homework to exercise your mind, to learn to be able to see the difference between the holy and unholy fear. But it means to let this attitude, let this mind be in you, that you're exercising your mind like Christ did, that you are mentally disposed to. In other words, your first reaction is to jump to the knowledge that comes from God, the wisdom that comes from God. It also means to go in a certain direction. We've talked about the difference between holy fear and unholy fear is direction. One is direction towards God, one is away. It also means to have an, a, an opinion or sentiment that not only are we mentally disposed to the fear of the Lord, not only are we exercising our mind in the fear of the Lord, 
Not only are we going in the same direction, the holy fear towards God, but we think it's important. And lastly, it means to interest oneself in. In other words, it's interesting to me. I, God gave me the ability to be quick understanding in this, and I'm going to use that ability to try to learn what God has for us here. Okay, so have this attitude, or let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance of a man, as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. Everything Christ did and taught was to point people to God so that they could see God as he really is high, and lift it up, his train, filling the temple, so that we could see ourselves as we really are, enemies of God, in rebellion to God, as sinners, and then to reconcile sinners back to God, to bring them back into right relationship with God. Messiah marked by the Spirit of the Lord being upon him, brings people back to true knowledge of God, right relationship with God, which is described by the Bible. And marked, we are to be marked by the year of fear of the Lord. Now, so we need to ask the question. It's a hard question. It's not... Uh, if I was speaking Russian, I would say it was not Puriatin, it's, it's not pleasant. But we have to ask it anyway. Last semester we talked about what kind of wisdom do they give you? Jeremiah chapter three. What kind of knowledge do they give you? Jeremiah 3, 15. It's a promise that God gives to his people uh, if they will repent in verse 15. Well, let's read verse 14. Return, O faithless sons, declares the Lord, for I am a master to you. And when I, I will take you one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Okay, we, we should not expect in the first parts of people coming back to God that there's going to be a lot of people joining us. The flood comes later. God says, I'm going to take you one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Verse 15 is where we need to put our attention. Then I will give you shepherds after my own heart. And they will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Now, the knowledge that he's speaking about here is the knowledge that speaks directly about knowledge of God, being in right relationship with God. And understanding here is the word that speaks about learning how to use wisdom, understanding, counsel and strength together. 
It's the root word of sagacity. People who are, they don't, they not just know it in theory, they know how to do it in actual practice in their life. Shepherds after God's own heart feed you with knowledge and understanding. Now, unfortunately, we live in a time when there are extremely, extremely few shepherds after God's own heart, feeding people with knowledge and understanding. It's just the, the times that we live in. We talked about uh, last year, men and women who understand the times with knowledge of what Israel, the church, should do. We're living in a time when there's very, very few shepherds who feed God's people with knowledge and understanding because although they're very well educated, we have a vast number of uh, pastors, elders, deacons, whatever, who are very well educated in the world's knowledge. But they, are, they cannot teach knowledge and understanding because they themselves don't have it. Okay. Jeremiah 10, 21. This is the opposite of shepherds after God's own heart. Verse 21 of chapter 10 of Jeremiah. For the shepherds have become, in New American Standard, it said stupid. King James, it says brutish. The shepherds have become stupid, brutish. They have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they have not prospered. Now, the word here, prospered, is the root word of sagacity. It's speaking about the person who has wisdom and understanding and knows how to use it with counsel and strength. And their flock is scattered. Do you have a Russian Bible with you? No? Okay. So it'd be interesting to see how they translate it. The shepherds have become stupid or brutish. It's a very interesting word in Hebrew. It's the word that, it, that means burned up or consumed by fire. Okay, so we're going to fix it and see what it says in Russian. Without like no, sense. no sense or understanding. See, in Hebrew, it's a very interesting word. And it means to burn up or consumed by fire. The idea is a shepherd who, before he takes his sheep out into the field, he goes and he burns up all the grass. He burns up everything that the sheep could possibly eat. Then once it's burned up, he takes them out there to eat. There's nothing for them to eat there. If you're feeding God's people with knowledge and understanding, there's food for their soul. If you think about the most of the preaching or teaching you've heard recently, a lot of it is anecdotes from the pastor's life, interesting moments from his life or something that he's read in a book. Sometimes they even teach books instead of having sermons. There's nothing there except the knowledge that comes from the world. 
That's all they have. That's how they were educated. They have not sought wisdom from God because to seek wisdom from God, they have to start with the fear of the Lord. Since they don't have wisdom from God, they don't know how to deal wisely. It is not wise to be brutish or stupid with the flock, to destroy the flock that God has given into your care. How has these false ones been able to steal the treasure of the fear of the Lord? because the shepherds have become stupid. They have sought, not sought knowledge from God, nor have they sought wisdom from God. They are not ignorant as the world calls ignorant. As the world calls, calls people, they're very educated, highly educated. You know, most churches today want somebody who has at least a master's degree and many want a doctorate degree. I can't tell you how many churches I've seen in the past year or two, the, their, the qualifications they demand from their pastor is minimum master's degree, desirable doctor's degree. It's a part-time church, 200 a week highly educated, but they don't, in the world's eyes, but they do not know the fear of the Lord. Jeremiah chapter two, verse eight. Now this is part of the apostasy of the nation of Israel, as they have forgotten the fear of the Lord, and because of that, they're being destroyed. Verse eight of chapter two. The priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who handle the law did not know me. Okay, now, if Jesus, Messiah, was marked, identified by the spirit of the Lord upon him, those who shepherd God's people, should they not also be marked or identified by that same spirit? Yes, they should. And in fact, as we've talked about many times before, uh, in 2 Corinthians, uh, therefore knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. It is a requ requirement a biblical requirement that the pastors, preachers, teachers know the fear of the Lord, or King James says terror. It's a requirement. It's all throughout the scripture. But the priests did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handle the law do not know me. Highly educated. But they have no knowledge of God. What is the beginning of knowledge? The fear of the Lord. Once we have this, then we find the Bible tells us in Proverbs, knowledge of God. They cannot give to the people what they themselves don't have. A lot of churches are not happy when someone comes who begins to feed them with knowledge and understanding. They're not used to it. It takes them a while to become used to it. But when God's people are fed knowledge and understanding as God requires, then the year of fear of the Lord increases. When they are not fed a steady diet of knowledge and understanding, the year of fear of the Lord decreases, and in the time in which we live today, the treasure has been stolen. They have not sought God. 
They have sought higher education. But in reality, they pretend they haven't sought God. If they were to truly seek God, look what happens. Proverbs 2, 5. Proverbs 2, 5 tells us, I'm going to read it how it appears in, in Hebrew and how it appears in the King James, not in this modern translation because they've missed it a little bit. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. God gives if we ask him faith. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Comes straight from God. Had they sought knowledge, had they sought wisdom, had they sought understanding, they would have found it in the year of fear of the Lord. But instead, they sought the world's wisdom, the world's knowledge, the world's understanding. And they have become stupid, brutish shepherds who destroy the flock rather than shepherd the flock of God. Since they have not sought knowledge, wisdom, or understanding, it is impossible for them to deal wisely. It is impossible for them to rule with wisdom. This is talking about a political sense. And if you look around the world today, politicians are not marked by the wisdom that comes from God. They're marked with the stupidness. And they have not led God's people with wisdom. They have not led, led the church, led the church with wisdom. Had they led the church, I'm sorry, had they fed the church with knowledge and understanding, had they led the church with wisdom, they would have secured all the blessings and benefits and blessed results that come from God's wisdom and they come from God's treasure. Instead of pastoring the flock, they have become brutish. They burn up the pasture, they destroy it. Matthew 23, 15. This is Jesus talking to the scribes and Pharisees. They had all this knowledge of the Torah. They had memorized it. They'd studied it. But they did not study it from God. They studied it from the world's perspective. And Jesus says to them, woe to you. Verse 15, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte, one convert. And when he has become one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Now, Brother Roberts calls this being inoculated against the gospel. These shepherds who do not feed people with knowledge and understanding feed them with things that makes them more and more blind. Remember when we started tonight, I gave you the characteristics of earthly, natural, demonic wisdom. And the first one is it produces spiritual blindness. 
So not only are they spiritually blind, but now they're twice blind because they think they know something when they really don't. But what they do know works against them and prevents them, stands as a stumbling block to them coming to the true knowledge of God. And a Luke 11.52 This again illustrates this principle. It's from the words of Christ. Woe to you lawyers. In other words, experts in the law, experts in the Mosaic law, people who know, who knew the, the Torah extremely well and taught it. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You yourselves did not enter the kingdom of heaven is what they're speaking about. You yourselves did not enter the kingdom and you hindered those who were trying to enter. Okay. They were very well educated, but they had no knowledge of God. They studied and learned doctrines about God. But without the fear of the Lord. And thus they preach and teach things. They preach and teach God's word from the perspective of the world. The shepherds after God's own heart feed people with knowledge and understanding because they have a relationship with God. That relationship biblically is called the year of fear of the Lord. That, was, that is what marks and identifies them as true people from God. Now, all true doctrines come from God. Just as God was giving to Adam and Eve all the knowledge they needed to control, subdue, fill the earth, God will give us all everything that we need to be prepared to shepherd God's people and feed them with knowledge and understanding, if we're willing to learn it. But knowledge from men even what we would call true doctrines from men who have no fear of the Lord and do not know the fear of the Lord produces spiritual blindness. Now, we need to understand this and it's not pretty. Luke chapter six, Verse 40. I'm going to give you two examples of this, one positive and one negative. This is Christ. A pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. Now, my dad is a professional guitarist. He is a outstanding guitarist. And over the years, he has taught hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people how to be, how to play the guitar. And one Sunday night, I was in a church and somebody up in the balcony was playing the guitar. And I said, I didn't know my dad was going to be here tonight. The person who was playing the guitar played exactly the way my father played. It would be like a ventri it would be like someone copying, like a parrot who copies or mimics the, the, the way he fingered the guitar, the way he picked the guitar everything. It sounded exactly like my dad. Is it important 
who teaches us. Jesus said a pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone after he has been fully trained will be like his teacher. Let's think about how important is it that someone who knows the fear of the Lord teaches us our ABCs or our one, two, threes, math or whatever. What if an atheist teaches us math or ABCs or how to read? What, what difference would that make? Knowledge comes from God. We want our children to have godly knowledge. God invented the alphabet. He invented numbers. I had a friend who wanted to be a doctor. And my friend was strong, Christian. And so my friend went to medical school. And shortly after my friend started medical school, I noticed that my friend's spiritual life was beginning to suffer greatly. So I went to my friend and I said, friend, what's happening? And my friend said, Kenny, you cannot believe our teachers at the medical school. They are so cultured. They are so educated. They're so smart. They have such knowledge. Everything about them is just super duper wonderful. And they put to shame Christians. Okay. Let me see if I understand this right. These professors are cultured. Yes, highly cultured. Educated, oh, highly educated, brilliant. Their knowledge, everything is just the best there could ever be. Okay. How many of them have done abortions? All of them. So let me get this straight. They're cultured, educated, Super knowledgeable, super wonderfully wonderful murderers. Who do you want to be like? The murderers. Are those who realize knowledge, including all medical knowledge, that comes from God because God invented our bodies. He knows how to fix them. And it doesn't make a difference. Yes, it does. That's why God said, therefore, knowing the fear or the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We don't teach, preach, minister, until we know the fear of the Lord, because the students become like their teachers in both the good and the bad. Hebrews 13. <clears throat> Hebrews 13, starting in verse 7. Remember those who led you. who spoke the word of God to you and consider the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do we want to follow those who were chasing hard after death, no matter how intelligent, cultured, smart, whatever word you want to use? Or do we want to follow those who follow Christ 
whose life is marked by, identified by, distinguished by the same characteristics that marked, identified, and characterized Messiah. God says, be ye holy, for I am holy. If he is our teacher, we'll be like our teacher. I love that. You know, some are thinking, Kenny, you've gotten off the track here, buddy. Talking about the fear of God, that's all right. This idea about knowledge and who's teaching you all of that stuff, Kenny, that's, oh boy, you're way out there in the left field, buddy. John chapter 14, verse 26. John chapter 14, verse 26. This is the words of Christ speaking about the Holy Spirit. Okay, we got it? John 14, 26. But the helper... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you some spiritual things, but everything else you got to go learn out from the world. Is that what it says? But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. Because all knowledge comes from God. All true knowledge. All eternal knowledge. All unchanging knowledge. All knowledge of how to fill the earth, to control it, to subdue it, to, to have dominion over. All comes from God. He will teach you all things. And bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. What I'm teaching is straight from the Bible. It's not in left field. It seems from left field because for all of these years, we have been fed not by knowledge and understanding, but we've been fed other things. So it seems strange to us. It seems new. But it's the old truth. It's the truth that Christ taught. It's the truth proclaimed throughout the Bible. It's the truth that was common knowledge. Once in our American churches and was inculcated, taught often and by reputation. It's just we have gone so far away by shepherds who are very well educated, intelligent but they have no knowledge of the fear of the Lord. All right, so I tried to have a short lesson tonight in case you might have some questions at the end. So let's see if anybody has some questions. Are they recording questions? Yeah. Just a second, I need a... Okay, is everybody turned on? Um, Maybe. So when he, in Jeremiah, he talks about this flock that is scattered. Right. So he's talking about, I mean, like, sheep, real sheep, or just, because like, I think about all those mega churches, they're huge. Right. I mean, and, you know, they seem very prosperous, but like when he talks about scattered okay so this is a very good question okay so we speak about the flock or it's saying like you said that all not all israel that is of israel right it's the same thing here right okay so the flock 
in the Old Testament, the church in the New Testament. We're going to speak of those as synonyms. God said not all who called Israel were true Israelites. So in the, the nation of Israel, there were some who were true citizens of the kingdom of God. Even in the most backslidden church, even if it's just one or two, there are going to be some who are true citizens of the kingdom of God, right? There's going to be others who regularly attend. Maybe they don't, not there every Sunday, but they're there. You see them, you know who they are, you recognize them. Others who attend less and less. The shepherd has a responsibility to these people, even though they are not yet true citizens of the kingdom of God. They haven't been born into God's kingdom yet. The shepherd, the Bible teacher, has a responsibility to these also to feed them with knowledge and understanding. Okay. So there's the, the, knowledge, the responsibility is there whether they take it or not, but it, from God it's there. And when he talks about that the flock is scattered, I mean, it's just those true ones, or like, what is it? It's all of them. All of them will be scattered. Those who are true, those who seem to be, have expressed some kind of a desire because they keep coming, they want to know the truth. They're going to be scattered also. Good question. Right, any other questions? Anybody online have a question? Nope. All right. Come, so come right here. All right. So if there's no questions, we'll call it a night. If you would prefer to send me your question in an email, that's fine also. So thank you guys for being here tonight, for being regular attendees. I appreciate it. And I pray that uh, God's word would grow Go deep into your heart and bear fruit. And that God would bless you and help. Father, thank you for helping us tonight. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to be able to understand these things. That you would teach us how to begin to recognize the difference between knowledge that comes from you and knowledge that comes from the world, which really is knowledge that comes from Satan. Help us to learn to reject the knowledge of the world and to hunger and thirst for the true knowledge of you and that our lives might be marked, characterized, identified by the same characteristics that marked, characterized, and identified Christ. That uh, you had a fear of the Lord these seven gifts would be readily apparent in our lives. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Um, before we say goodbye, you might remember, uh, some of you, most of you maybe have heard me talk about the church making the Jews jealous. And this is one of the signs of, of the, the end times. Uh, the Jews become jealous when they see the wisdom knowledge 
understanding and fear of the Lord in us. That's the part that makes them jealous, biblically speaking. Good night. Thank you. Good night, Rich. Good night, Anton. Give our love to your daughter for her birthday. Good night, everyone.